Hello, Fun Nation. My name is James, checking in here with team number 2910, Jack and the Bot, here at the first championship. And guys, this robot is simply a marvel. There's so much to learn from. They got Mark V. You heard that right? Five swerve modules on this robot. There's just incredible arm that they've learned oh, over the years just how to perfect this. Uh, they won the Pacific Northwest District Championship, one of the top EPAs in the world. There's so much to discover here on Fun. Here with me, I have Kylie, Drew, and Sue here. Let's find out more on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. First teams benefit when they optimize their robots utilizing Altair tools. If you're utilizing Altair, submit a video showing your optimization skills and potentially win up to $5,000 for your team or $2,000 for yourself each quarter from now until June 30th, 2025. Download Altair tools for free and view contest details when you scan the QR code or go to altair.com contest. Anymark provides superior service with the reliability that teams expect. Check out their sport gearbox and ratchet sport options to their tried and true compliant wheels used by teams all over the world. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Anymark.com for your one-stop shop of high quality and affordable solutions. All right, Kylie, why don't you take us through the arm on the Jack and Bot robot, really just marvelous machine you built. Yeah, so um, this year we decided to focus on this concept of like familiarity. And so since in 2023, we built um, our arm and it worked very well for us in 2023. So this we decided this year we we're going to go back onto this idea and um, use our arm. And so essentially, since we had already used it in 2023, we had already noticed a few of the problems. And so um, this year we uh, basically made improvements to it. So some of the major differences is basically the added length here. And so in 2023, it was much um, shorter because uh, we didn't have to score that high, but this year it's much longer. So we have this added um, length here. And so uh, another thing that's really unique is that our pulley is going the same speed as our E-chain. And so um, our pulley, sorry, our pulley is going the same speed as our chain. And so we decided that if we can just combine it so that our E-chain can just go be, it's driven by the chain. So that way it's much more efficient. And when we pull it and extend it, they're going at the same speed. Um, especially in 2023, originally our, it was pulled by uh, constant force springs, which is kind of dangerous. And so this is just a much better change. Um, another thing that we added is uh, we have our gearboxes instead of it being up here, we have subset it into our drive base, and uh, that helps with uh, the lower CG, which is really nice. And so we have three packins each to power the extension and the pivot. And so we have um, the gear ratio for the pivot is uh, 120.83 like, to 1, while the extension is um, around 8 to 1. And so we just have the gearboxes that are sitting in our drive base and you have the chain that runs over to the sprocket. And so another thing on our arm is our climber. And so our climber is really compact and small because uh, we're using our arm that, um, to climb instead of actually having a climber mechanism helping us to climb. And so we have these two large uh, black wheels here and it's allowing us to help us center. And so it's spinning and when it's spinning, it helps us center with one um, bar of the cage. And what's actually mechanically la uh, locking us into the cage are these springed um, latches. So these spring-loaded latches are the ones that are actually holding us on to the cage. And when we torque our arm down and pivot it down, that's what lifts us up. And our climber that actually is moving with this gearbox down here on our arm, um, with a chain that runs at the underneath of our arm, it's moving and it will move down to kind of the pivot point of our um, entire robot to help us balance ourselves with our center of mass to allow us to be level and make sure that we're not like on one side. And another special thing is simultaneously while we're doing that during our climb, we're also extending our arm a little bit so that these hooks down here will basically hook into a whole cutout um, in our bumper. And when that hooks, it mechanically locks us in. So even after the buzzer rings, um, our robot will not relax because 
um, it is mechanically locked in. So it ensures that we um, stay climbed for the three seconds after the buzzer. Wow, right? Like that's just such an incredible engineering decisions and just the creativity in this machine, right? So I want to ask you about the decision to have the climber move. Did you guys originally do that already or was that kind of an iteration you made on the climber? No, yeah, so this was actually a decision that we decided to make um, on our very original um, version of our climber. Uh, it was something that we had already uh, realized and that something that we wanted to do. So our climber actually has not really changed a lot from its initial iteration. Oh, except this. This is actually new. A lot of people have been wondering what this is. This is actually a piece of the algae that we have cut <laughs> and taped, or zip tied actually. And um, that is because we were sliding off of our cage bar. And so with this, it's just adding an extra little bit of like friction to help us um, stay on there. And it's not very aesthetically pleasing, but it does, it works really well. Well, it fits the theme, and I think I can see the, uh, the remnants back there in your pit. <laughs> but uh, moving over to Drew now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this intake. We've seen other teams kind of getting inspiration from it. It's able to center coral so well and pick it up from all directions. Tell me a little bit more about how you discovered that, as well as some of the other cool features on this robot, like your Mark V experimental modules. Yeah, so at the beginning of the season, we knew that we would need a ground intake because we saw that the game piece was circular and we could probably roll it all the way to the reef. Um, and so in doing that, we got very lucky with our prototyping. This was actually the first prototype that we tried was this model of intake and it worked on the first time. So um, there are two sets of vertical wheels and one horizontal wheel for the coral intake. And then there's the second um, horizontal wheel for the algae. Um, and so the coral intake, which I think is the cool part, um, can take coral in from any angle that it ends up on the ground and put it into any angle that we want it to be on the robot. So we pull it in straight for L2 through 4, and we pull it in hot dog style for L1. And so we, you'll notice that we have four can ranges on the, on the intake. And so based off which can ranges are tripped, the robot detects how the coral is oriented. So we know if it's coming in and it's blocking all four, but we want it to be straight, we have to move it to the side before we can actually intake it. And if it's coming on on the side, but we want it to be horizontal, we can side shift it and slide it all the way over. Um, this is the third iteration of our intake um, where we have the two wheels powered separately. In earlier iterations, we were powering them this together um, and we had the uh, different durometers on the left versus right. So it was two blues and then two greens. Um, and that still allowed us for the side shifting, but it didn't allow us to um, accurately intake coral for L1. And so that's why we switched um, to having separately driven intake rollers. Um, and then the other thing that you probably all want to hear about are the Mark Vs. So this is the, these are, these are right now just prototypes. Um, they have a handful of improvements. Um, one of the ones that I'm the happiest with is that they have, they are fully enclosed. Uh, the bevel gears are enclosed, so you don't get any carpet fuzz in the bevel gears or in any of your gears. So you can just like load them up with grease and they run really smooth. Um, another thing is that they don't have belts anymore. They have a um, big gear for instead of the pulley that was originally driving the turreting motion. Um, and um, changing out the gear ratios is very simple. It's like five minutes. Um, you just have to change out the motor pinion, which is accessible without removing, disassembling any of the rest of the module. Um, yeah, uh, they, we switched these in right before Worlds, and they were very easy to set up and like basically just a drop-in replacement. Yeah, we have a clear module right here that you can look at. Uh, this is the drive pinion. It's a custom modeled gear that um, 
has a cover so that the cover's still intact, but you can pull the pinion out. And this screw, you can loosen and move to the different indentations so that um, it changes the distance between the pinion and the idler gear. Um, yeah, and then we'll also have the West Coast Products spiky wheels with custom molded hubs for these modules. And the wheels are a lot wider, as you might, have, might see. Um, the billet wheels are two and a quarter inches wide, and the spiky wheels are two inches wide. Well, Drew, really incredible stuff. I'm excited to see what that does to the whole first landscape and everything like that. The enclosure is going to be really nice. I'd like to shift over now to Stu here and talk a little bit more about the software that makes this machine tick. Obviously, you guys performing at a really high level. How are you achieving that with this robot? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah. Um, Drew and Kylie talked a lot about these amazing mechanical subsystems that we have on our robot. So I'd like to go over a little bit about how we control them at a very low level. So I know a lot of teams use um, WPI lib command based to control and organize their subsystems. We actually don't do that. Um, we really uh, want to follow a full uh, aim to follow a philosophy of like finite state machines with all of our subsystems. So each subsystem is strictly structured as a finite state machine with um, enum wanted states that can be converted to current states that then apply to, uh, that then end up controlling the motors. This is baked in with advantage kit abstraction. So then we have automatic logging on our, all of our subsystems. And another thing we did this year to reduce latency on our main robot thread was to multi-thread logging on all of our subsystems. So obviously we have all CTRE motors, um, you know, Krakens or, uh, x44s and so um what we did was we had the um uh, the base the status signal values that uh you know pulled the like motor data we have those being pulled and you know read on a different thread and then it's then passed back to the main thread which can use it for logic so each of the subsystems is its own finite state machine and the way you control it is you just pass in like an enum state you don't say go to this position you don't say um you know like roll at this voltage it's like okay enter the intake state or enter this you know move to position arm state right um so then on top of that the way that we control each of these subsystems and then we kind of string them together to get really coordinated robot action is through something that we call our superstructure so our superstructure is just a wpi lib subsystem that accepts um um all of the other subsystems on the robot so like it'll you know except i think it's the arm which uh, has the wrist, then the intake, which controls the rollers, then the climber, and then the drive base, I think are the main you know, degrees of freedom. So it accepts all of those things, and then what it's able to do is, okay, if we wanna you know, do some sort of coordinated action, like intake a piece, it then tells each of the individual subsystems what to do in order to make that happen. So it's like, okay, tell the arm, go to the you know, ground coral collection pose, and then you know, say, okay, roll the wheels until you, know, you have a coral, and then it's stripped, then move the arm. So I think that's one of the, you know, really cool things about how we control our code is we have these really organized and defined states. So it's very easy for us to coordinate robot action between all of these different coordinated, um, com sorry, complicated subsystems. And so on top of that, I'd like to talk a little bit about our control scheme, um, which kind of blends very nicely into uh, this superstructure architecture. So we actually have, we run a single driver uh, here on 2910. And so like no operator, right? So we use the sticks for like controlling swerve, but what's really cool this year is we made really good use of the back paddles to you know get the most out of this robot function. So you know some of these buttons can do four different things based on what uh, game piece state we'll call it the robots in. So I can like take you through each of the mining. So when we don't have a piece, the um, right side of this is used for coral collection. So for example, this could be you know a straight coral collect. This could be a horizontal or hot dog coral collect. Um, this could be a station. This is the station uh, coral collect. And then the left side, uh, left bumper would be ground algae. This would be reef algae. Um, and then you know those are automated. So then if we end up having a straight coral, um, these uh, button bindings shift into the different positions on the reef that you can score. So this would be right L4, right L3, right L2, and then you know same for the left side. And then um, we have automated L1 scoring as well. And in order to maximize our points that we can score in a match because the reef gets so full, we have automated stacking on the trough. So we can score six per face in an organized fashion. So if you pick up the coral horizontal, like Drew was talking about earlier, um, you can use this button to create like the base of the stack and then this one to create the top of the stack. And then the last, you know, permutation, if you will, of uh, 
button bindings is algae. And so in, when we have algae, we would use, we use manual eject for algae. Um, these bumpers are used for scoring in the barge, and then these triggers are used for scoring in the processor. So with that being said, I think you, you know, you'll notice that like, it is just one button to you know, score coral, right? And I think one of the really cool things about a robot this year that has really increased our performance is we have like fully automa automatic scoring. So what that is, is you press one button, the robot will automatically drive to the correct scoring position and then eject the piece um, and you know, the piece is scored. So I wanna talk a little bit about you know, how that happens and um, it happens with the help of you know, these, these four limelights that we have here on the robot. So if you think about scoring on the reef as like a problem, you have kind of two, uh, I'll say we have kind of two inputs to our system. So um, we have uh, what side, like do you want to score on the left like reef pole or the right reef pole? And then what level do you want to score on? Those are the two inputs that the driver provides to the system. And then the system figures out everything else. So the system figures out which rotation to snap to, which um, you know position to drive to, and then which arm position to move and when to eject. And so I think the way that we figured that out is really cool. So we have two what we call reef selection methods. So one of them is rotation-based, so I'll talk about that first. So our rotation-based um, reef selection method, essentially what we do is we say that, okay, um, you know, the driver has initiated, let's say, a right L4 scoring command, right? And so at, at that point, let's say the robot is pointed at zero degrees and we're on the blue lines. So because um, we can score over the front and back, um, if we're pointed at zero degrees, this could mean we're either scoring on the very front face of the reef or the very back face of the reef. So, um, knowing this, what we then say to each of our four limelights is, okay, do the front limelights see the tag that's supposed to be on the front of the reef, um, or do the back limelights see the tag that's supposed to be on the back of the reef? So based on that, you can figure out, um, you know, what side you're like the driver's actually trying to score on, and then at that point, okay, it's like okay, let's say that you know the the tag was right here um, behind these limelights, it'll know that, okay, I have to score over the back, so it's going to you know, hold the current rotation or snap to the you know, closest 60 degree angle, and then um, you know, drive to that position, uh, which we d is essentially a translation off the April tags pose, uh, move the arm up to the correct position, and once the drive base and the arm are within tolerance, it's gonna automatically eject. Um, this also, uh, one thing that I kind of forgot to mention, so the reason this rotation-based method works is it essentially ch picks the closest 60 degree angle to choose as the um, input to the system, and it'll snap to that as well, right? Because obviously if you're at like, um, not one of the angles that directly fits on the hexagon, that there's not really a reef face that's associated with that. So it snaps to the closest one and then determines the reef face based off of that. The other um, reef selection method that we have is called our pose-based. Um, reselection method and so what that does is it takes the current pose of the robot which we're tracking passively over time using wheel odometry when we're not scoring and it says okay which of the six april tags that you know of the alliance that i'm on is the robot closest to and so at that point you automatically know which reef your reef face you're going to score on um so that's covered and then obviously you know the side because that's an input to the system and then the robot automatically figures out whether it's faster to snap uh, to have the front of the robot snap to face that reef face or um have the back of the robot face that reef face. So that's also fully automated. And so we switch between these two methods in the match. They both have different strengths. Rotation base is good when we're doing long translations across the field and our odometry tends to slightly get off. Whereas pose base is really helpful for if we're trying to really quickly fill up a reef face, we don't really have to worry about getting the robot into the current rotation before initiating an automatic scoring sequence. Well, Sudhir, in 2910, it has simply been a joy to learn more about your robot today. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Uh, best of luck at the rest of the championships. It's no wonder that you guys are competing here. Uh, just simply incredible. Wish Thank you, you very much. Luck. Yep. Thank you all for watching. My name is James for Fun Robotics Network, signing off. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Animark provides superior service with the reliability that teams expect. Check out their sport gearbox and ratchet sport options to their tried and true compliant wheels used by teams all over the world. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to animark.com for your one-stop shop of high quality and affordable solutions. First teams benefit when they optimize their robots utilizing Altair tools. If you're utilizing Altair, submit a video showing your optimization skills and potentially win up to $5,000 for your team or $2,000 for yourself each quarter from now until June 30th, 2025. Download Altair tools for free and view contest details when you scan the QR code or go to altair.com contest.